I couldn't understand what was happening, like why some of the times it would be silver and other times it would be silver violet. And then one time I had my reading glasses, I was like, they're different. <laughs> like, <laughs> of course it's different. <laughs> but it's one of those moments that became really like, at first I was terrified, I'm never going to find this bottle again, this is a mistake. <laughs> like, let me get it analyzed in a lab. <laughs> Stupid. I just remember getting a text from you and you were like, I don't know, something crazy is happening in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> Like it was haunted or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we should say that we're very good friends. So this is like a conversation that we've been having privately for a very long time. Yeah. I wanted to start in 2012. Okay. And I want to start there because I feel like, I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen the show yet, but I, I think if you know Julie's work, you'll see that there's some, some real shifts here. Um, so I want to start in 2012 because for me, that was the last time I could really plot what I perceived as a major shift in the work, like radical shift in the work. It was when the architectural lines kind of go, went away. It was when the blur enters, the gestures become more predominant. Mm. So. I want to read a quote of something that we had a private conversation and recorded it, um, and I had it transcribed, and I turn to it every now and then when I write about your work. Um, but this is what you said about that time. Between two things where there's an erasure of something, and I want to think about the erasure as not just that particular body of work, but what it means to move on mm. in your work. So I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> What is, what has grown, what is now found in the fissure between what you had done and what you've done now? And what has emerged for you in this new body of work? I think, um, I, was, I was thinking about that actually a little bit earlier today. And I, I think, um, when you, as a young artist, you one is just really trying to figure out who they are, and they're they're working. You're, one is working. You're like working through um, your work, and and the way that I started to approach that was I, I had I had a lot of kind of deep um, like I would I was trying to conceptually build something, but then have to let go in order to like be able to draw or mm -hmm. be able to get lost and like turn mm -hmm. the brain off so that mm -hmm. you can work, like, so it becomes a kind of disembodied experience. But I think that I had these, I, I, I felt that I needed to build some kind of structure to make sense of, to give some purpose to these, to what I was doing, to like understand that. What ended up happening, and I think what I feel has happened the most in this exhibition is when I, re I realized what I was saying about my mark making and my drawing mm -hmm. and my work, I was actually, instead of the marks challenging the architecture or becoming like, they were always somehow con restricted by the architecture as well. Mm. So in the end, if they were battling, the architecture won, right? Which is a bad thing. So, mm -hmm. you, so that's why I left, had to leave the architecture uh, aside. Meaning a mark could never be truly liberated mm -hmm. in, that, in that space of the, uh, with the architecture somehow. Because it always was a reference mm -hmm. or some type of, um, something that located the mark. And so if, if, if we could just leave the, mar leave the architecture, then the marks become something else. But what I mean is when you get, become an older artist, or, more, or, or maybe some people get it really right, or right away, but for me it took a long time, the more I would just let things happen and try to not put things together in a particular way, they came together nine by nine by nine, mm -hmm. right? So there's this, so the more freedom, the more kind of, uh, openness and just following this kind of intuition and trusting and uh, there were times in the studio I was looking around I was like these paintings have not what are they doing with each other you know mm -hmm. and then yet there's this there's something that came together there's this kind of underlying kind of logic that mm -hmm. so so in a way the more the, these feel the more the most free is what I'm trying to say I guess or and I still feel like they're not like how do you find that that other image how do you conjure an image Mm -hmm. through this process, and it's the excitement of what will that be mm -hmm. without having a clear sense of that. But, so that was one thing. The other thing is, seeing paintings backwards 
or from or from their beginning. You you never get to do that with painting. You always see painting at the like you you can look at prints backwards. Or you, I'm working with a glass project right now. You can look at mm -hmm. you paint on the reverse side of the glass. Mm -hmm. But painting, you 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 things get covered, mm -hmm. or things and they get buried in there, and they're a part of the art art inside. But this, you see the first marks from the backside. Mm -hmm. You you see the the painting from its earliest stage, and then you see the painting on the other side. So there's this really interesting kind of space of wh what is that space? Yeah, I, I'm interested in two things you said or that I want to expand on. One is this idea of like, I knew that you had described some of the mark making as characters. Yeah. I'm also interested, and this is early work, I'm also interested in the way in which you talked about the paintings themselves as events and that you just mentioned a kind of um, disembodiment. Right. And I, I might want to put pressure on the disembodiment because I feel like there's something about the body that is really present in these words, mm -hmm. whether the fact that you can circumnavigate it or with, and I want to talk about the black paintings in particular, the way in which you literally have this phenomenological shift mm -hmm as you navigate them. Um, but so maybe we can, maybe we can like go there in terms of the black paintings. I remember saying to you when I saw the gray paintings in 2012, um, where this kind of shift is happening, I remember saying to you, when are you gonna make black paintings? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, how am I gonna do that? I like doing this and I'm doing that. Black. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the mark has always been that, right? Yeah. The line yeah. that appears in the work. But I'm curious as to materially why, and also conceptually, why you felt compelled to make what I would call nine black paintings. And I said this to someone last night, and they said, oh, but they're not black. And I was like, so there's a whole history in terms of black painting where you look at an artist like Sam Gilliam or mm -hmm. you look at your contemporary like Ellen Gallagher mm -hmm. where there is always a color that threads through the work. Um, but that's not to say that they're still not still black paintings. Yeah, they're it's, black paintings. Yeah. Sure. Would you talk about why this body of work and why it felt? So it's it, again, this is go going back to that place of like trying to just let um, in the studio and an and intuitive thought, let, li, like following that lead. We were, a year ago or something, we were in the desert um, with my family and I was taking the kids and-, and ma, This and was ma, Utah. Yeah, and we were out there and uh, we were climbing at the standing, you know, what is it called? The Arches Memorial, like the Arches Monument Park, mm -hmm. right? And we were climbing through these, amazing terrain and it's very, very red and yellow and then these weird, beautiful striations in the rock that look like airbrush. They look like spray paint. And, and I just, I don't know why, it was a red field, why I thought about black paintings, but I really was excited about uh, the idea of this, of the white mark more than anything else. And for me then it was just, yeah, for some, I went to black. Mm -hmm. Maybe part of the reason of the black paintings is also, and I'm just thinking about this now is, um, I worked with um, uh, the, the performance last fall at the Park Avenue Armory, mm -hmm. which four of these paintings were in that were in that presentation. And I think thinking about monochromatic light, um, it was a 50th anniversary uh, for the Rothko Chapel. What What was really interesting is I was working with Peter Sellers, and mm -hmm. we went there, and. You know, I, 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 you have this idea of Rothko in a particular way, or you have this idea of Feldman, but both of them came from real, like it's not as if, the, like you don't learn about those paintings as political mm -hmm. actions, but they were so, these were people who were coming, like, you know, both Jewish immigrant, coming from Jewish immigrant families mm -hmm. into New York, post-war moment, and really like dealing with the tragedy of the United States through the civil rights like mm -hmm. violence of that moment there there's and and it's and it's interesting because we don't and the Rothko Chapel is very much this political gesture in that way we know that but to really be there and rethink that and I was reading Feldman I was reading um about Rothko and I was reading about Feldman doing this piece I don't know maybe that also I think you know but I I just know that it came to me when I was in the desert mm. with those white marks so then I was like 
I think in a sense it's a reversal of the black mark on the white. So I wanted to play with that reversal. And then I went to the store and thought I bought silver ink and white ink and some of that ink, because I didn't have my glasses on, was silver violet. And I would never have bought that had I known. So, and then it became, I couldn't understand what was happening. Like why some of the times it would be silver and other times it would be silver violet. And then one time I had my reading glasses, I was like, they're different. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Of course it's different. <laughs> but it's one of those moments that became really like, at first I was terrified. I'm never going to find this bottle again. This is a mistake. <laughs> like, let me get it analyzed in a lab. <laughs> Stupid. I just remember getting a text from you and you were like, I don't know, something crazy's happened in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it was haunted or something. Yeah. I couldn't understand it. So I did those two paintings as a test, but also before that, I was in, while I was working on those in, in Berlin last summer, I was um, in Athens for another project, and I was looking at these churches, and I saw these very small, um, in these really tiny churches, you know, they're all through Athens, and I don't remember which one, but it's that one that's really small under that big building, if anyone knows Athens, and in that, in that church, there were these um, really, really old uh, frescoes that had turned black. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that remained was the halo, w with mm -hmm. that, that, because it was like a leaf or something like that. So that's all, everything else in the image was kind of just melted, you know, mm -hmm. you couldn't see it. Probably, I mean, I don't know if you, if you could even restore it. But that was like, it stood out to me too. Mm -hmm. So those two things kind of led into this, and then it was really the freest group of paintings I've made, like, because there's nothing underneath them except that. Huh. There's no lines, there's no gray, there's no blur, they're there's totally, no image. there's no image, and they just, like, spilled out of me. How did you feel about the, like, there's this tension, right, or we've been told that there's this tension around theatricality and the art object in terms of, like, visual art, Yeah. right? So depending on my height, that light is going to shift and change differently in it. Whether I'm taller, I'm gonna see it differently. Yeah. Or if I'm shorter, or if I'm sitting down. And I've looked at it from various vantage points. What happened in you as someone that was interested in characters, interested in the inventfulness of painting, meaning painting as event, right? and now the, the viewership as event? I think you're right. There's always been th there in some way because you s you even the old paintings with the, the big, large paintings with the architectural drawing and the paintings that took forever, you would you could go into that and or, or same thing with this large painting that's in the in the big gallery there. There's you 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 can go in and you have a very different experience when you're up close and with in certain parts and how one participates with that that like that changes like. Mm -hmm person to person, but what really is, the, and that's like the cinematic kind of aspect of, the, of, of those kinds of experiences, but I guess like, so I've always been interested in the, ex the time-based experiential side of, of what a work of art can do, mm -hmm. and especially painting. Like painting is, my, is the thing that I've been really like just obsessed with so much, and I look at, at, at everything that I can. And so I think that idea of a time-based, like how do you extend that? But also, how do you how do you have something where it really is sentient? Like mm -hmm. it, re you really can make something feel like you you re you 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 you, f you have a visceral kind of reaction or response to something. And that's what I'm trying to understand or let unfold let let it unfold, right? Or let these gifts kind of come into the mm -hmm. and and in a way, it's like um, I guess what I'm what I love about that or what I'm really interested in with it, captivated, is like how ungraspable they are. Like how much, what, what excited me was when I started working on those paintings in Berlin, I would walk into the studio and they looked one way when I would walk in, they would look completely different from the other side. And that whole transformation, that whole place of like even can you trust what you see? Mm. Those kinds of questions, those, I, I, I became really excited by like trying to figure that out. Like, mm. and not that you figure it out, but that what could happen? Mm -hmm. And to me, the paintings come, ac they work together almost like a score. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, like, um, they remind me of Zanassa's drawings, the Greek composer, and mm -hmm. other forms of like that, other, other types of scores. But they have this, they have really, an, I feel like almost, uh, th from one to nine, you really go through this whole, these different movements, mm -hmm. as you would with a piece of music. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. I think they also, 
because they are black paintings, track in a very particular way to this history of, I would just say, black monochromatic painting. Right. Um, wherein, if you remember, I don't know how many people remember this, but they discovered that uh, under that Malevich black on a white square, yeah. um, that in fact, there were sort of racist jokes written on the margins that there was a, a cubist form, a futurist form underneath that black monochrome, which is like cracking and insisting on emerging through it. So there's already an implication in terms of like a body mm. that is black because the quote said, um, Negroes battling in a cave at night. That was the joke and Alphonse Allé, um joke that had been in a newspaper and circulate and it's the first black monochrome that we can track in visual art. And Malevich is riffing on that and then others start riffing on that and nobody's disclosing that they're riffing on that. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in how you might feel about working in this, you know, the black monochrome seems to have an unending usefulness in modern and contemporary right. art. I like, how does it feel for you um, to enter that, I feel like, that field with this work, or that discourse with this work. Like, are you thinking at all about that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can think about the color black without thinking about, you know, even when you say the word black, it's it's not just a color. It's like, it's so, it's I mean, it's, it's so many things, but it's people, mm -hmm. right? It's like, mm -hmm. um, and so, and those paintings really feel like traces of of actions, right? They're like mm -hmm. they're recordings of something in a way, right? Or like, mm -hmm. so they're so you, f you the the kind of beingness in them is very um, very visceral, like mm -hmm. you, and uh, yeah. So I yeah, I don't know how to. I don't. I don't want to go too deep into like mm -hmm. that because I feel like you spell it out too much or something. What's mm -hmm. going on? But I think there is like black paintings are political paintings. There's no way they're not that they're, they're not right. Mm -hmm because of that history. And, but that just being, just, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, as most things it's are. Really, it's really complicated and really rich, and it's a, in, a, in, a, in a sense kind of an a, a, a joyful space to, to work in. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I, I wanna get to. It's like, how do you, how can like, and that's the thing, I used to be so labored about the way I would work, and I feel like there's mm -hmm. this like looseness and freedom, and, and there's a space of, um, and necessity of this kind of challenge to do something ambitious, but but joyfully, like with with like a kind of space of possible, like really allowing that possibility to be this space of, you know, a space of liberation, and 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 that's like to allow that to happen, it, and to be, you know, to know what is going on in this world, like it's it's really I think it's it's really that by itself is political, right, like. And maybe just a last note on this. I just want to say I feel that optimism or that joyful or yeah. desire for the joyful yeah. in the shine. <laughs> exactly. Right? And in, in the way that... In the that, flicker. Yeah. Like it really, I feel like, shifts it radically yeah. for me. It's, it's performativity that, pr that contributes to that, right? Yeah. Like they kind of moot dance. And yeah. Yeah. But it's entirely subjective. <laughs> okay. It I'm is move entirely on. subjective. Um... I want to talk now, I think, about collaboration. Okay. But, but maybe before I do that, I'm going to do a little, maybe we could prelude it a little bit. Okay. And so it's, it's about these structures and the trans paintings, which I think extend this idea of a kind of theatricality too, right? Like, but it also puts pressure. I mean, for me, it's a real turn because it raises the question of sculpture in your work, or some hybrid painting, mm. sculpture. It's a duet with Nairi. Yeah. Um, in a pas de deux, in a sense of like that, right? So I'm, I'm curious. I love the, that, that it's a duet. Yeah. And I like thinking about it that way. Beautiful. So how did you, why did you want to come off the wall? During pandemic, I was working upstate on this group of black and white blurred paintings with um, different kinds of airbrush. They had some screen printing in them, 
but not a, not a lot. Some of them were just this kind of airbrush marks, very loose uh, on these black and white blurs. But the blurs were all images, very ghostly images of different, um, basically different places of of, migra of migratory kind of uh, places where um, migrants were imprisoned in different places, whether it's Libya, whether it's in the southern border in the United States. But none of the images had bodies in them. They were just the places. One was a place that, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a bom they bombed these places in Libya where they were, whole they were actually keeping many, many um, migrants from all these different southern African countries. And so I was like looking at, I was interested in those spaces and the, and the haunting of those spaces, what happens in those spaces, especially the ones in the US where we were, we were um, basically imprisoning children and separating them from the families. And that became like, a, like, you know, as a parent, especially, but any human, like you just, how do you make those kinds of decisions and like, how do you do that? But what happens in those spaces? That's what I'm, I'm more, like those children are, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 now. And so my interest is what is in the, that psyche? And so the first painting I did that came, like it, why I was really, what could happen to that blur? What happens outside of that? The haunting is there, but there's this other possibility that exists too, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like abuse kills anyone. <laughs> like it can, and it can really like eliminate a life, but it can also, many, many, many of us have suffered forms of abuse and mm -hmm. many of us have suffered traumas and yet we're th there's this invention and that's, the, that's like the invention of blackness, right? Like mm -hmm. blackness is, has been, I think, its, its revolution is in its existence and mm -hmm. its continued existence and insistence on what it can be. And so to me, um, looking at those paintings, wa that haunting in them but this other sense of something else existing, mm -hmm. like what could that be? I became really interested in that and then, how your shadow affected that. Again, this participation in the viewing of the painting, how you move through that and your shadow would, and so when you get up close to these paintings, you can't really tell what the blur is. You just see, it looks like a shadow. It could be your shadow or it looks like a shadow emerging from the painting, you, like you couldn't really see them. Then after that show, I woke up and I was like, it would be really cool to see somebody else's shadow through them. Like that, mm -hmm. just that slight thing to shift the painting. Mm -hmm. So I was more interested, I think, in that. And then I didn't know how I would ever do them. It's really extraordinary um, because of this kind of frontality and, and the backness, but this ability to move in relationship to it. It's, it's, it's a very different experience of the work. Yeah. And you mentioned that you do still see them as having fronts and backs. Like there's a differential between totally. experience. Would you talk oh, about that? Yeah. So then, so what I was saying earlier about the f the the blur, seeing the inside of the painting, seeing seeing a painting backwards. Mm -hmm. um, I like that idea of trying to talk, like trying to talk backwards, or trying to, what, what like the, the, it, there's some kind of like spirit in that that mm -hmm. I'm really that I'm in that I'm su super interested in. Like it go it go it plays with that space of unknowability of the the ungraspable again and. Um, precarity and kind of, you know, these, the, it, like, not, not fully trust, like, what, do, what am I looking at? What am I seeing? Like, is the, there's the phantom, these things feel ethereal, but they're really there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're held by Nairi's sculptures that, you know, sculptural structures that, you know, hold them taut and clamp them and, like, force them upright mm -hmm. and, they, and force them to stand and bear witness in a way, and there's mm -hmm. this kind of like here I am aspect to them, like Hineni, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they, they pr they're here, they're present, and yet they're like, you can tell there's something else, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and so, so I love the back and I love being able to see what, see how different that is. And when you have a lot more in the painting, you can really see the underpainting from the back and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the gestures, and some of them get so layered that, that you can hardly see through. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in all of that and, and, and and how they break down. I think as beings, I see them as somehow, you know, as captured, as capturing something, not, I don't, you know, in the same way I always th thought of my mark making as characters, I mm -hmm. still think of all these as participating with one who is the viewer. That's why I started to work so large. I was always interested, I think, and still am, mm -hmm. in how we participate in the, in the process of, of a painting. And that experiential kind of tra transformation that can happen. And so to me, these stand here present, mm. but they're all like ghost images of 
really shitty disasters, but they, there's this other light that still can emanate, right? Or can, is still possible. You've collaborated with Peter Sellers, Jason Moran, Robin Cost Lewis, um, poet, musician, theater director. Is this your first collaboration with a visual artist? Yeah. Nairi worked on this, it, like in the way that I work on a painting, in that at first she was like, I can't, I, she, she was really busy, she's been working on many exhibitions, and she sent me a structure, and then just said, you know, they're, they're just the display, they're all kind of the same, but then you can make the frame. I was like, okay, so mm. I'm gonna just do this with aluminum, and she kind of saw that, and was like, oh, I don't mm. know about that. <laughs> and then, she had some feelings. <laughs> yeah, and she, <laughs> but it kept going back and forth, and that's actually one of the reasons, but it, you know, what happens is, ideas just come to you sometimes, and it's like, the creative process, I think, is about really being open to mm. that, and allowing that this, the unknown in and the terrifying in to like let some other space happen. And I think with Nairi, something happened where she saw the images of what we sent, like these sketch ups that we did. And, and I think it came to her, this idea of the brace, like because all of a sudden it was from one rendering to another, they became sculptural. Mm -hmm. And before that, and, and I was so excited because that's the reason I went to her mm -hmm. is for that type of a constraint. And I would never have imagined something like like what she came up with, which feels to me like it's, it's um, yeah, they're really displays, you know, but they're, they're integral to it in a way. Yeah, it's like the system, the structure that had been there with the line emerge, comes back mm -hmm. after some time, but not in the piece itself, but rather as a surround of right. it or something. Well, and it's that's really such a rich space. And I think about that in terms of space, in terms of knowledge, in terms of concepts of, of land, um, indigeneity, um, n like really, like that, that idea of the surround, I mean, Fred Moten talks mm -hmm. about this idea of the surround as this kind of other form of knowledge. And I feel like what I'm interested in in the creative process is, is, is that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's this, it's like I talk about intuition as another sense. We don't, it's not credited with mm -hmm. the same kind of idea or knowledge because you can't identify it in the same way you can identify taste or smell. But I do think like it's a very strong sense and understanding that as an artist gets, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes so much time and it gets, if you really are, oh, are, can, be, can be comfortable to hone that, mm -hmm. it can be like really interesting because it just, things open up. But it can be terrifying too because you know you can fall on your face. Yeah. But the risk is always important. 